initially, uh, the gas was supposed to be very cheap, but the real price of the gas we now know. The real price of the gas is also the blood of uh, soldiers and people, children and, and women in, in Ukraine. And the real price of gas is the current uh, harsh winter coming in Europe. Good morning and welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for The Post. I'm honored to be joined this morning by Poland's Prime Minister, Mateusz uh, Morawiecki. Uh, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, welcome to Washington Post Live. Can you hear me now? Good morning, David. Thanks for having yes, me. Good, good morning, Mr. Prime Minister. We, we can hear you. And again, thank you for joining us. Uh, I want to begin, Mr. Prime Minister, with the war on your next door, uh, on your border uh, in Ukraine. I was in Warsaw uh, this month for the Warsaw Security Forum, and I was struck by how passionate Poles are, starting with your president and as many Polish officials and, and citizens that I met, uh, how passionately they feel about this war. Could you just tell our viewers briefly why Ukraine's fight against Russia is so important to the Polish people? Well, it's very important for Polish people, but it is critically important for, for the whole of Europe. And I believe that Poles know this all too well. And uh, we also know the risks which are related to with uh, aggressive Russian uh, politics and uh, with their uh, with their um, aggression and war crimes in Ukraine. And this is why we are very active and we try to organize sanctions in Europe, um, uh, one package after another, so that the sanctions really bite uh, Russian economy, which is which started to happen. Um, and, and this is also why, uh, by and large, every poll uh, understands what's going on behind our, beyond our eastern uh, border. And this is also why I'm, I can be so proud with my countrymen uh, for how all the country behaved in the, in the context of the recent refugee uh, waves. And also in the context of supporting Ukraine in their fight for freedom, sovereignty, and independence. So, Mr. Prime Minister, Russia this week continued what we would call its nuclear saber rattling uh, with uh, warnings to Western governments about what they claimed were Ukrainian plans to use a dirty bomb, apparently bogus uh, claims. But this uh, continued the concern that Russia may itself be preparing to use uh, nuclear weapons. Do you believe, does your government believe that, that there's a significant possibility that Russia could actually use these weapons? Well, I, I would not exclude uh, any option because Russia uh, is um, um, now um, in, in a place where, where they have never expected themselves to be and they probably uh, are um, going to escalate uh, the situation in Ukraine. I just hope they are not going, to, they, they, are, they won't be using nuclear, tactical nuclear weapon. But it's clear to me that um, Putin and the Kremlin, they uh, do not view the war in Ukraine as the only battlefield. It is one of several battlefields, like the other, the other ones being cyberspace, cybersecurity, uh, propaganda and information field, and economy in particular. And this is why I, I think that uh, all the tools from the um, uh, toolkit of um, the Kremlin have to be very carefully analyzed. And I wouldn't exclude anything, I, but I, I hope that they will stop from uh, using um, nuclear uh, weapon, tactical nuclear weapon or nuclear weapon as such. So, Mr. Prime Minister, given that, as you say, you can't exclude the possibility that they could use these terrible weapons, I want to ask you what preparations your government in Poland is taking for the possibility that they could be used and how you're seeking to protect your citizens in Poland from possible uh, 
consequences of the use of these weapons? Well, uh, on the one hand, we are distributing um, all the necessary um, uh, uh, pills, which are which are which are used in in the case of um, are of pills? some of some um, pollution, like we have this experience from 1986, uh, April, uh, when the Chernobyl disaster happened. And uh, Poland, uh, back then a communist country, uh, which, uh, which uh, suffered a lot because, uh, because we were not informed by the communist government uh, immediately after the disaster would have happened. And, uh, and and many Poles have this trauma still till today. Uh, so uh, on the one hand, this, these are these uh, normal preparations, but on the other hand, um, we are part of the strongest alliance uh, in the world, NATO, and and we believe that um, Putin and the Kremlin, President Putin and, and the Kremlin will uh, stop short of uh, using uh, disaster, disastrous and um, uh, mass weapon of mass, mass destruction. Uh, but, but of course, prepare, hope for the best, prepare for the worst. So, so we are uh, in the process of preparation. And, and just one more question, uh, Mr. Prime Minister, about, about preparation. Your government, uh, I read, ordered an inventory uh, this month of air raid shelters in uh, Poland. Uh, 62,000 is the number of shelters that, that I, I gather you, you uh, located. Are you considering actual training of your citizens so that they have a clear idea of where these shelters are, how to get to them, uh, preparations in, in other ways for the possibility that they might be necessary? Well, this, this is part of the process of, of preparing uh, people uh, for an uh, incident which might uh, happen. And yes, the counting of shelters and creating new ones uh, or using in, in existing infrastructure for that purpose is, is one part of this process. So you talked about Poland, uh, Poland, about NATO a moment ago. And I want to ask you, Poland has been a key transfer point for the extraordinary flow of weapons in support uh, of Ukraine. Uh, and there's been concern that Russia might strike uh, at these transfer points along your border. Uh, if Russian strikes uh, went inside P Polish territory, uh, would Poland immediately request NATO support under Article 5 of the NATO Charter? Well, I strongly believe that the words which President Biden said in, in Warsaw several months ago, that not even an inch or a square inch of the um, NATO soil can, can be attacked without uh, very serious consequences and, uh, uh, and a, and a counter-strike ba based on solidarity. So uh, we are um, a very, a very a reliable ally of the US and NATO for the last 25 years and we believe that um, we have this um, shelter and support from uh, all the NATO and the US in particular. And yes, you're right, uh, it, um, um, much of the support, military support and humanitarian um, aid goes through our airport and our routes. Uh, this is why we also count with uh, and uh, m bad scenarios. Uh, it's, it is another um, element of, of the same chapter which we would have discussed five minutes ago uh, and we are preparing for different scenarios. Having said that, we, all, we already have good anti-missile and anti-aircraft uh, uh, systems uh, prepared uh, in um, in cooperation with the US or, um, with, with the US, US forces and with, with the United States Army and with the, our United Kingdom uh, friends and uh, this is uh, not as we know 100% guarantee but um, our uh, our um, uh, um, uh, sky uh, is also quite well covered 
uh, with the air policing by the jets and uh, with uh, anti-missile uh, and anti-aircraft -air shields, uh, which we have um, uh, located and installed in, in several places. Sir, I think you answered this in part, but I, I want to pose a, a question from a mem member of our audience uh, named Marion from Maryland, who asks, what would pre prevent Russia from attempting to coerce an annexation of Poland if it were to succeed in Ukraine? Uh, give us a sense of, of what that would mean in terms of your response if this invasion should be successful. But I, I I exclude such a scenario because this could 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 have been a, could be a, a disaster for for the whole of Europe. So this is why not only Poland but also uh, many other countries, in particular of eastern flank of NATO and eastern flank of the European Union, are very active in helping Ukraine to survive and to preserve their uh, maintain their independence and and territorial integrity. Uh, th this is why in, in the, I have to exclude such scenario in the first place. Uh, on the other hand, I believe that NATO and NATO's credibility uh, is uh, in um, defending, lies very strongly in, in defending uh, all of its 30 members. And I believe that uh, none of the members can be attacked without um, uh, without uh, other countries coming with their support on the basis of the of the device one for all and all for one mr prime minister you've been uh, forthright in in speaking about this war and the potential dangers i want to ask you what message would you want to send today to president putin in russia about this war and about poland's resolve we are not going to surrender. We are not going to uh, to uh, leave uh, to uh, leave um, Ukraine with without support, without help, and not only military support but also financial support, because this could be the next uh, big game of uh, the Kremlin to make Ukraine uh, to to go bankrupt, uh, because uh, Ukraine has to pay. Uh, salaries for to, for the soldiers and teachers, doctors, nurses, judges, and so on, so that the state is at least half functioning. Uh, they the the, the 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 very likely imagination of President Putin and uh, his people is that uh, once Ukraine is deprived of financial support the public opinion in Ukraine is no longer supporting its soldiers and um, the fighting spirit and the very high morale of of Ukrainians will go down and uh, President Zelensky is going to for be forced to uh, to negotiate a bad deal from the Ukrainian point of view. This is this is a quite likely uh, scenario in the um, uh, on, on the on the um, uh, Kremlin's um, uh, working um, um, desks, and and this is why we have to organize not only weapon and humanitarian aid, but we also have to organize um, financial support for Ukraine to survive those uh, winter months. But also, I'm particularly happy with the recent developments on the European Council um, in Brussels, where, together with my Baltic friends and other Eastern uh, European countries, we were able to we were able to work uh, a solid financial package, work out a solid fi financial package for for Ukraine. Mr. Prime Minister, one more question about the uh, Ukraine war, and then I want to ask about some other issues uh, facing uh, Poland. President Biden has said that he believes that this war must end in a negotiate, negotiated settlement that's favorable to, to Ukraine. Do you agree with that, or do you think that uh, some sort of total military victory is possible for Ukraine on the battlefield? It is possible. Uh, the, the real 
problems of the Russian army on the on the battlefield uh, confirm that all scenarios can happen, and also um, this very optimistic scenario that um, that Russians uh, would be pushed out of the Ukrainian territory. This is also um, quite possible. Uh, having said that, it's up to Ukrainian people and President Zelensky to uh, to decide what is an acceptable uh, position, acceptable um, uh, terms and conditions for any potential future peace treaty. So uh, let me t turn now to questions about energy and about the European Union that are facing you in the, in the months ahead. In our uh, preliminary footage uh, before we begin our conversation, we quoted you as saying that the Kremlin was acting like a drug dealer over gas supplies. Um, I want to ask you what your plan, Poland's current plan, is to deal with the energy supply crisis that you're going to be facing along with your neighbors this winter. Well, we were quite uh, prudent and preventive in terms of what uh, might have happened and we would have expected uh, those bad scenarios to happen. This is why in 2016 we have started to build a new pipeline system to Norway and Denmark and we have just uh, finished all the works and this is why for the first time in our history Poland is independent of uh, Russian gas and uh, the other fossil fuels we were able to very quickly um, revert the Russian direction uh, the Russian imports uh, and replace them um, uh, with uh, other directions and other imports from from all over the globe uh, really so for the first time in our history we are not dependent on Russian fossil fuels but uh, this is uh, quite a rare situation in Europe because there was this mm, addiction and there was this uh, huge, huge mistake uh, made by the Germans uh, in, their, um, in their policy of uh, dependency on Russian gas. They, they, have actually did, they, they have actually done this intentionally for the last 15 years. They have built Nord Stream 1 and then Nord Stream 2, which was about to be operational and the war uh, broke out. And this is why uh, most likely, I hope, uh, it is never going to be operational um, in the future. But uh, it is an indicator that uh, Germany put all the eggs into the Russian basket, so to say, and it was a huge, huge uh, mistake. And now lots of Europe suffers because of those mistakes and uh, all the aggress aggressive policy of uh, President Putin. And uh, in Poland, we were preparing for this for the last five, six years intensively we would have built LNG terminal uh, and we have long-term contracts with the American and Qatar um, companies. We have built uh, additional interconnectors to Slovakia, to Lithuania, to the Czech Republic. We are going to build um, or to locate another floating uh, terminal for uh, LNG gas. So not only we are, we're going to be independent of Russian gas, but we can be um, uh, provider of gas security, gas-related security to, to the others in Central Europe. Mr. Prime Minister, let me ask you frankly, do you think that Germany has learned its lesson after making what you describe as a terrible mistake in relying too much on Russia? Has Germany really turned course or are you still waiting for more signs of that? I hope yes, I hope they've learned this lesson because the, the lesson is quite harsh for them as well. Uh, it means recession, maybe even a bad recession in Germany over the next couple of quarters uh, or into 2023. It means uh, the highest inflation uh, since 1951. So it's the highest inflation in Germany 
um, uh, since uh, the post-war times. Uh, incredibly, isn't it? Um, it's that the, the, this indirectly contributed to the highest inflation in uh, all the countries of the European Union, and it is a very high inflation in the United States, as I hear as well. So the the ripple effects uh, are already there, and the situation is getting worse and worse because we not only encounter huge energy crisis and the crisis related with the level of inflation, that level of inflation, but also we see a financial crisis in the making in many countries in the world, in particular those uh, which have very high uh, debt, public debt to GDP, but also private debt in emerging markets, in particular in those countries where private debt is denominated in dollars, is going to um, uh, to be very painful. So it's it's a, just a very quick um, landscape of potential problems uh, which are ahead of us. Uh, this is why I, I believe that our German partners and many other um, friends in Western Europe understood that the strategy of uh, dependency on Russian not only gas, dependency on Russian natural resources and raw materials was very, very wrong. Mr. Prime Minister, one of the other headlines coming out of last week's EU summit uh, concerned uh, Poland and the judgment that uh, Poland was not complying with the EU's Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, concerning certain matters in your uh, legal system and that the EU, EU therefore would uh, withhold some of the cohesion funds that otherwise would have been paid to, to Poland. What, what's your response to, to this argument that, that Poland is not complying with the Charter and do you think this matter is going to be resolved soon? Poland and the United Kingdom some 15 years ago um, have uh, signed a so-called protocol or British protocol, protocol number 30. It is part of the treaty. Protocols are part of the primary law in the European Union. It is not that the laws included or the majority of the uh, provisions included in the um, charter, uh, which you mentioned, sir, are not um, observed and are not part of our Polish system. It is that we didn't want it, exactly as the United Kingdom back then didn't want it, to include yet another uh, international document into our legal system. The United States are doing the same uh, quite frequently, but we have those exactly the same rights, sometimes even uh, in a um, um, much stronger uh, wording of those in our constitution. And this is why uh, it is uh, not at all uh, a jeopardy for our, um, for our um, cohesion funds, as you asked, and, and the other funds of the European Union. There is additional fund uh, related to uh, post-COVID uh, times uh, called Next Generation EU and here we, uh, I hope we are uh, in a final stage of explaining some differences between the European Commission and ourselves. Mr. Prime Minister, I know you have a, a, a hard out, as we say, a departure time. I want to thank you for joining us, having visited Poland several times uh, recently. I'm struck by the generosity of your country towards Ukrainian ref refugees, the way Polish people have stepped up and taken people into their homes. Thank you for joining us this morning for a very interesting conversation. We hope you'll come back. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. And uh, in particular, I'd like to thank you for your kind words towards my countrymen. They really deserve it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So uh, we'll be back with much more Washington Post Live programming. To see what we've got coming up, please go to Washington Post Live. Dot com. I'm David Ignatius. Thank you for joining us this morning for this conversation with the Polish Prime Minister.